ओके सो हेलो एवरी वन वेलकम टू पी एम एफ आई एस करंट अफेयर टेस्ट सीरीज माई नेम इज आशीष मलिक एंड दिस इज योर पार्ट नंबर फोर ऑफ द टेस्ट नंबर एट दैट वी वर डिस्कसिंग इन दिस पर्टिकुलर वीडियो वी वुड बी टेकिंग अप द नेक्स्ट सेट ऑफ द फोर ट्वेंटी क्वेश्चन फ्रॉम द टेस्ट नंबर एट एंड आई रियली होप दैट यू हैव इन्जॉयड द फर्स्ट थ्री पार्ट इफ यू डिड देन लेट अस नो इन द कॉमेंट सेक्शन बॉक्स योर फीडबैक मैटर्स अ लॉट एंड डो नॉट फर्गेट टू चेक आउट द पी एम एफ आई एस टेस्ट सीरीज विच इज अवेलेबल एट ए स्पेशल प्राइस ऑफ जस्ट फोर The link is in the description below where you can go and practice 1000 high quality MCQs so do not forget to check that out Now going to the question number 61 the question 61 was with respect to the central asian flyways First of all you need to understand what is a flyway the way we have the way the way we have the highways for the movement of the of the vehicles uh, or we have the airways for the movement uh, the dedicated space for the movement of the aircrafts similarly the birds have their own flyways flyways are the the path which are taken by the migratory birds to migrate from one place to the another and get back to their home so that space that birds utilizes for the migration is very famously popularly called as a flyway now there are many flyways there are approximately 8 9 major flyways across the world but we are talking specifically with respect to the central asian flyway first of all i would like to show you where exactly is this central asian flyway is as you can see in the green patch this is your central asian flyway look this entire area is a paradise for the migratory birds they keep migrating they are here you have you see you can see there are so so many hundreds and hundreds of the asian migratory birds they uh, they keep they use this flyway to you know migrate uh, having their seasonal migrations other than central asian highway we have other major asian highways that includes the east asian asian australian flyway and there is also called as the west pacific flyways but here the question was dedicatedly about the central asian flyway now when i say central asian indian flyway so why this is so important because this particular flyway is something which india introduced during the 14th meeting of the conference of the parties to the cms which is called the conservation of the migratory species very popularly called the cms cop 14 so that that make that actually makes this flyway stand a uh, stand away or stand above the other flyways because india introduced this particular uh, central asian indian flyway so two things to remember which countries brain child india where india proposed it was the cms cop 14 now this indian initiative it was supported by the bird life international which is the most important body when it comes to the conservation of the migratory birds and other than this organization there are other 30 countries government they all supported india for this particular initiative the idea is simple why the flyways are introduced the idea is very simple this is an initiative where we want to restore and maintain the favorable conservation status of the migratory species and of course we want to assist them in their ecological connectivity while they migrate from one place to the another especially across the central asian countries india and other countries that is that is our objective and after many researches we have understood there are more than 600 migratory birds which are using this particular path and that is why it is so important to have a proper dedicated flyway for that you can easily see if you if you can see the map you can easily understand look at the look at the countries there are so many countries all the countries of south asia central asia and even lot of countries from the west asia they are all the part of this particular asian migrate uh, this uh, central asian indian flyway and you have very crucial culturally very very important birds you will see in you using this particular flyway that actually includes the white stork in uzbekistan black necked crane in bhutan and the steppe eagle in kazakhstan they are culturally very important birds uh, for these particular countries so you never know you may have a question match the following kind of question coming on that also so if you look at the options guys the question was a straight a straight away question uh it says yes introduced by india and the meeting number is also correct the convention is also correct the first statement is correct 
and when it comes to the central asian indian flyway so yes imagine i told you all the countries that, that you can think of in south asia southeast asia west asia all these countries and even the east asia so mongolia myanmar nepal oman yemen all are the part of this particular highway now which statement is not correct when it says which statement is not correct right now these are very important things that you need to understand since both the statements are correct here the answer is supposed to be d because i told you both statements are correct and neither is not correct so this is something you really have to be careful because sometimes after after um, getting the right answer we mark it wrong if you if you don't read them properly right so here the right answer is supposed to be d neither one nor two i would say the question was a medium level question the name itself says a lot yeah you may have a problem with the number of meeting that can still be a little bit uh, you know problem for many students but the name itself says the central asian that tells you the name of the countries that you you can focus upon and flyway you know it is all about the migratory birds and what and whenever you talk about migratory birds it is the cms that is the apex uh, you know organization or the convention which that that actually works for the migratory birds so i would say this was a medium level question but could have been attempted without any trouble guys now that brings us to the question number 62 this is about the donkey skin now very important question guys donkey skin has recently been banned in the african union that is absolutely true and this is one particular thing that was in news it was a viral news when african union decided to do, to do that how and why let's try to understand so the context this is this is considered and it is actually historic decision made by the african union where they said we are banning the trade in donkey skin that actually recognize socio economic importance of donkey in africa lots and lots of Af african donkeys they were smuggled they were exported to countries like china why china because in china the donkey skin is used in lot of medicines and for that purpose now africa because africa has its own socio economic importance associated with the donkeys and that's why there is a trade ban done by african union african union is a group of 55 all african countries uh, the entire continent we have the african union and do expect a question coming on the african union i told you many times because recently it has joined formally it has joined the g20 <coughs> group this time so that's why you may expect question coming on the african union itself okay so after this decision the idea is simple to protect or prohibit the killing of donkeys for the skin across the continent this decision is important because it follows the dar es salaam declaration for the first uh, uh, african union and the ibar pan african donkey conference so this particular declaration dar es salaam declaration also has the same context of banning the trade in donkeys or donkey skins so if by chance you have this question coming dar es salaam declaration relates to which of the following at least be prepared for an mcq stand alone mcq on that as well okay that is important so like i told you the donkey skin and why africa is so important when it comes to donkey population because it is africa africa is home to two third of the donkeys like there are approximately 53 million donkeys worldwide out of that all, almost two third donkeys belong to africa alone and the donkey skin is very much in demand in traditional chinese medicine market and especially there is a chinese traditional medicine called as the ajio ajio is basically a gelatin manufactured by boiling the donkey skin and that's why in a lot of traditional medicines donkey skin was in demand and that was that is why uh, you know and 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 for this one product alone do you believe only for one this particular product almost 60 lakh donkey skins are required on annual basis and you know majority of them go by the illegal smuggling trading scandals and all that and that is why that is why and and look at the trends the demand for the agio is increasingly like like a crazy but in the last 5 years the production and the demand actually increased 160% and that's why this decision was was taken by the african union so if you look at the statement 
all the three statements are absolutely correct in this case answer is supposed to be D it was a medium level question um, I believe if not all but and see because obviously there are facts involved in this question so you can take a risk this, uh, depending on how much you have read this question I would not say skip it all together because you have this elimination option uh, there are very few questions these days which are which have this elimination option at least try to risk these questions do not skip them all together if the question is about only one only two only three then you can skip at least but here whenever wherever you are getting this choice of elimination at least do that try to attempt that take a little bit of risk on that okay now the question is question number 63 the question 63 is with respect to the world restoration flagship now what this world restoration flagship is all about the very first thing are you aware which particular bodies are involved for the UN restoration flagship and what exactly it commits so two things are very important so when I when I talk about the UA, United Nations world restoration flagship first thing is first this kind of program it is led by two important UN bodies one UNEP United Nations Environment Program and another one is FAO the Food and Agriculture Organization so first thing is first when you talk about world restoration flagship talk about these two groups UNEP and FAO they both have named seven initiatives as together as UN world restoration flagship so individually there is nothing called as world restoration flagship actually there are total seven initiatives in the world which are the brainchild of these UNEP and FAO and together as an umbrella term they are they have put all the seven initiatives under the so called UN world restoration flagship and which are these seven initiatives do expect MCQ coming on that as well so the seven initiatives which are under the umbrella of UN restoration flagship includes number one restoring Mediterranean forest initiative living Indus initiative the Achean Anida social movement Sri Lankan mangrove regeneration initiative regreening Africa forest garden program you have the Terai arc landscape there is a separate question also coming uh, on Terai uh, arc landscape we have a question on that coming next so yeah these are the seven initiatives that FAO and UNEP they have put under the UN flagship restoration flagship so all these initiatives at least the names are very very important and second thing is important why this restoration flagship matters the idea is simple what exactly UNEP and FAO are they trying the objective of this UN uh, restoration flagship is simple to prevent halt and if possible reverse the degradation of the ecosystem on every continent and every ocean whatever damage we have done so far we really want to prevent it halt it and if possible reverse that for that matter you this whole idea of flagship is very very important from where the funding is going to come well uh, when it comes to the technical and financial support it is the United Nations going to support this particular thing okay this is absolutely important now if you look at the question guys yes both statements look correct here without any issue both statements straightforward questions now please understand if you look at the statement number two the word restoration itself says a lot I mean very easily you can relate statement number two with with the word restoration I know I understand first statement is still tricky because because when you talk about world restoration you can't be sure it can be other other bodies as well so yes the first one is quite risky if you do not know about but second is very obvious this is something you can easily predict so I would say this question was a medium level and by taking little of the risk you can still solve it because the second one is self explanatory so you you are not in a in a position where you absolutely have no idea about it but in this particular case the right answer is supposed to be C so both 1 and 2 are correct guys that brings us to the next question which is question 64 and this is a question of Terai arc landscape which I told it's it's one of the flagship initiatives it's one of the initiatives under the UN uh, flagship restoration flagship we just have mentioned right so now now look at this from a standalone question 
what is this terai you know you you know about the terai region right whenever you read about the <clears throat> the ganga plains then you must have read about the bhabar plains the terai region the bangard and the khadar regions it's a very famous four alluvials that we talk about and associate with the ganga plains so if you have read about the terai region you know this is a region between india and nepal this is very obvious to understand it little bit more what exactly is this terai arc landscape and why it matters so much so look if this is your shivaliks if this is your shivaliks the bottom of the shivaliks we have the bhabar bhabar the coarser plains after bhabar you have the terai region terai region what happens so whatever like uh, like all the streams that got disappear in the bhabar region they actually reappear in terai so terai regions are always the marshy areas the terai regions are quite marshy they are quite wet and that's why they are even good for agriculture at many places so terai arc landscape is a whole more than 800 km stretch south of bhabar south of Sh uh, shivaliks and this entire region is between the river yamuna and between the river bhagmati in the east yamuna in the west bhagmati in the east so this is a pure factual question you can't do anything about it you can't make up the rivers for yourself please look at the map first and i really want you to have a focus on this particular region now this region guys from here to here this particular region is what you call as terai arc landscape and you can see this area is between india and nepal and there are three indian states that actually are part of this terai arc landscape here you have uttarakhand being a part up is a part and also the the areas of bihar the northern bihar is also part of this so called terai arc landscape i hope that makes sense to everyone now this is this was actually our second question now if you look at the statement now i just told you and i've i've shown you on the map so clearly my second statement is wrong because it says it spread across only two states no sir there are three states that are part of the terai arc landscape uttarakhand up and bihar and remember it's a boundary between india and nepal even if you remember that then also you can straight away eliminate option number 2 first is correct the third is also correct because we have many 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 protected areas are there in this particular belt of terai arc why i am saying that guys please try to understand if you look at this so called terai belt or the terai arc belt here you have lots of protected areas like the corbett tiger reserve is a, is a part of the tal you have rajaji national park here dudwa tiger reserve here the valmiki tiger reserve here these uh, this uh, uh, you know corbett belongs to uttarakhand then you have the rajaji also uttarakhand the dudwa or the valmiki they belongs to up and bihar respectively so now my suggestion is any protected area that comes in news for one way or the other always make sure you remember the name of the state of that particular protected area this is important guys and please do read about the terai region the terai flood plains because here the streams reappear those streams which were lost at the bhabar areas what is a bhabar area they are the coarser areas so they have the boulder deposits terais are quite marshy lands so this is a very important topic that you should be preparing here so clearly in this case if you look uh, my second statement is wrong barring that first and third being the correct one so here it's it was a factual question and you don't get to get worried about the arc landscape the key word is terai i know terai very well it's a very famous region that we have between india and nepal so by applying that logic common sense i can still get my answer so answer is only two level of the question was quite medium but something you could have attempted easily without much trouble and second one is obviously wrong so you can easily predict that as well brings us to the question number 65 guys question number 65 that actually talks about the financial stability and development council what is this fsdc now this is a very important body what exactly it does in which ministry this functions every single point is quite important so let's learn about the financial stability development council and then we'll come back or uh, like based on because it says it ask you if it is a statutory body it has the question has ask you which ministry the question is also 
asked you under which committee we have got this uh, financial stability and development council so there are a lot of things that you need to know about the fsdc but the first thing is first fsdc i should write somewhere the fsdc is clearly it works under ministry of finance that is true but not as a statutory body it is a non statutory apex council it is not backed by any act of parliament there is no act of parliament backing the powers of the fsdc it is under ministry of finance but as a non statutory body because it was constituted not by act of parliament but by simple and executive order in 2010 now fsdc sub committee is actually headed by the governor of the rbi that this again can be a very crucial information for the mcq and this one council is required to meet whenever there is a requirement the council can invite the experts for the meeting and they can meet any time they want now which committee has recommended the idea of the F fsdc it was the raguram rajan committee in 2008 on financial sector that reforms the first proposed the creation of the fsdc so not any other committee so so many quite many times i rec i highly recommend there is always a chance of at least one or two questions coming with respect to committees so i am going to give this committee wala type of question at least three stars they are important now who exactly are the members who are the part of the fd fd uh, fsdc so talking of the fsdc's composition structure the chairman is the finance minister that is very obvious under which the minister under which ministry it works but other than chairman being finance ministers there are other members that actually include the heads of all financial sector regulator the rbi sebi the pfrda irda all of them even the finance secretary is a part of it the secretary of the department of economic affairs is a member secretary department finance services is a member even the chief economic advisor is a part of fsdc and then you have minister of state responsible for de uh, the department of economic affairs you have the revenue secretaries you have secretary of department of uh, electronics and it you have chairman of the insolvency bankruptcy court so you can see the list goes on and on and on so all these big dignitaries are actually a member of the fsdc which is chaired by the finance minister clear now if you go back so clearly i can see the two problematic statements one it says it is statutory it is not why it the question becomes difficult because this body was constituted way back almost 14 years back so obviously it's difficult to you know instantly think about these kind of bodies so better you revise these kind of bodies through the test series because obviously they are not they are not considered to be part of what to say as a as a pure current affairs they are they they used to be current affair at one point of time but not any more but still upsc has this habit of you know coming out with some old questions and that to blend it with some new sense so it is not statutory body and it is not the tarapur committee it is the raguram rajan committee so remember raguram rajan committee for fsdc so first and second are not correct third is correct so if you eliminate even by eliminating the options you can still get the answer so clearly i have got my answers eliminated and i am only left with option c you're only by eliminating the first two so in this case yes you can still you have this option of elimination if you eliminate you can still get your answer so question i would say it was a tough one tough question i would i would rate it but i think you can still take a risk at least you have this elimination technique uh, available and by little bit of knowledge you can still go and solve solve this question if you are not in a position to at, at you have never heard of anything like that then what option but to skip but try to eliminate smartly try to eliminate the things and you may get to the right answer question number 66 talks about the inset 3ds what is this inset 3ds and why we should be knowing about it that's absolutely important talking about the inset so obviously the name says it's a satellite the insat is indian satellite the word insat is indian satellite this is a collaborative effort between isro and imo indian meteorological organization the insat series that we are launching it's a third generation meteorological satellite series which we are going to place into the geostationary orbit everything is important right from generation to which orbit 
now the UPSC can manipulate here can tell you that it is going to be put in geosynchronous orbit so be very careful about the orbit in which orbit the question is saying so orbit itself is a very important thing that you should prepare and this whole project is entirely funded by Ministry of Earth Sciences and we are launching this satellite by using the GSLV F14 which is a three stage launch vehicle for heavy payloads why this inset is so important very obvious so so far you have you must have guessed it's a meteorologically important satellite so what what objective or what work it will do simple it will it is going to monitor the earth surface it is also going to monitor the oceanic environment across the multiple spectral channels it will collect a lot of data and of course it is going to share the data so that we can understand earth surface and oceanic environment even better that is a simple objective this inside 3ds has actually four payloads and it has an imager it has a sounder a data relay transponder and satellite which is again aided by search and rescue transponders and of course it, it is capable of generating images of the earth in multiple spectral images across six wavelength bands that is the power that is the capability of this initiative if you look at the question you can straight away understand the first statement is being wrong inset 3ds has nothing to do with nasa sir this is pure atmanirbhar bharat this is pure india indian effort so isro along with imo we are two collaborating pure indian nasa has nothing to do with it so straight away one is incorrect second third they are correct now please remember when whenever you think of nasa and you think of isro yes there is a mission of the where the two are collaborating not this one but that mission is called nisar mission the both are collaborating for Nisar mission. Now, can you tell me? Now, this is my question to all of you. Can you tell me in the comment section below that Nisar, Nisar uh, satellite or Nisar objective? What what it targets at? What are the targets that we want to achieve under Nisar? What are the objective of this Nisar mission? If you know, then let me know in the comment section box. How many statements are correct? Two are correct. First being the wrong one. It's it's not uh, right. And please understand, as the name, the name itself, so there is absolutely no inside series where we are dependent on any foreign body. For all inside series, we are totally Atmanirbhar. So, going by that logic, the name itself says a lot. The question was a medium one. For some people, it may look a tough one, but majority people will find it as a medium question. But something, you could, you could still take a risk and you can attempt this question because inside series, if you look at the option number two, option number three, they are pretty much easy options. First one being tough, but the second and the third options are correct. So answer is B in this case. Okay. The key word is inset. And if it is an Indian satellite, we are not collaborating. Talking about the satellites, there is another important topic in 867 question. That is about the cryogenics. Now cryogenic science is something we have been discussing for so long. It's very popular topic, very obvious topic that you need to prepare for the UPSC prelims. Talking of the cryogenic, it's a science related to the behavior of material at a high temperature. No, sir. Cryogenic is all about determining the behavior of the material at a very low temperature. The temperature goes in minus degree Celsius. That is cryogenics that operate at a very low temperature. So straight away, my option number one is wrong. And always remember, when I talk about cryogenic, it has nothing to do with nitro liquid nitrogen. It is the liquid hydrogen that is the key propellant of the cryogenic. So two facts I know by heart. So clearly the first and the second are wrong. Now the third statement says the cryogenics generally used as a last stage of the space launch vehicle. Now that you need to figure out. But at least you, you are in a position to straight away eliminate option one and option two. Right guys? So yes, remember, you think of cryogenic, it is always going to determine the behavior of the material at a very low temperature, minus degree Celsius. And cryogenics always going to use liquid hydrogen as a main fuel. Hydrogen, of course, it's, it is very difficult to handle the hydrogen, but uh, once you liquefy it, it liquefies only at a very low temperatures. And that's why in cryogenics, we are using the liquid hydrogen, very interestingly. 
yes every cryogenic engine that we make cryogenic engines are a three stages engines and we are using the cryogenics in our GSLV in all the heavy payload missions of Indian space we are using GSLV geosynchronous satellite launch vehicles and remember in all the GS, GSLVs we are using the cryogenics which are three stage uh, engines and here the cryogenic is the upper stage or the last stage the first two they are, that they are mix of one solid one liquid so first stage can be a solid fuel stage second stage can be liquid fuel and then third the last stage is going to be the cryogenic stage so that is how it works so yes in this particular case I, I can tell you the right answer is supposed to be only one this is the right one first second wrong so yeah this question I think it was a easy question cryogenic is a very simple topic and uh, very obvious options are there so I don't see any problem in that and you can you few things you need to remember question number 68 is with respect to the corruption perception index again very very important topic guys corruption perception index is a report released by which of the following now please understand a very simple trick to decode it and also to remember it why there is corruption we always say the corruption persists due to lack of transparency right I hope you will agree with me on that wherever there is lack of transparency there is always problem of corruption so which institute is there that publishes the corruption perception index answer is transparency international that is how I have remembered it for once and all without transparency there would be corruption so any report on corruption is to do with the transparency international very straightforward easy question no if and but right and I hope you now you have understood the technique of remembering remembering it for the future as well so it is transparency in uh, international this one particular organization releases this annual it's an annual exercise where they release the corruption perception index for 2023 recently now very interestingly there is a score of on this uh, on this whole index there's a score of 0 to 100 0 score means highly corrupt and 100 means clean clean country when you talk about the top performers it is Denmark Finland New Zealand Norway now these are the countries having least level of corruption least level of corruption I would love to live in these kind of countries some at some day I want to spend my time some time in these countries and, and just feel how a country without corruption looks like isn't it and when you talk about the worst performers it is Myanmar Afghanistan North Korea Somalia means they are highly corrupt countries they are highly highly corrupt countries what about Asia in Asia Singapore is the best performing country which is at fifth rank with a score of 83 what about India you see India's rank has improved little bit India's sorry uh, uh, yeah score India's score has decreased so India's rank has even fallen down India's score used to be 40 in 2020 now score is 39 so that is why India's rank was 85th rank in 2020 now out of 80 India is at 93 so India is has actually slipped down India has slipped down on corruption because as per this report corruption in, in India has actually increased what is what you need to know about the transparency international what is the credibility of this body this is an international non-governmental body it's an international NGO which is founded 1993 in Germany Berlin and it is their job that they publishes all the data with respect to the corruptions and corruption perception index is one of their finest and most trusted works that brings to another survey that brings us to the question 69 and here we are talking about the herpeto fauna survey what is this herpeto her, uh, herpeto herpeto fauna survey what is this why it is in news but remember which statement is not correct is something you have to figure out which is not correct so first we'll talk about the survey and why it is in news that we also need to understand so first thing is first this herpeto faunal survey it is done to identify and list all the reptiles and amphibians remember this is your keyword 
so this is one particular kind of survey which is dedicatedly done to identify and list all the reptiles and the amphibians and as per the survey 82 species of reptiles and amphibians exist and recently some of the key species identified by this particular survey includes the vulnerable mugger crocodile and near threatened indian rock python guys the iucn status all these vulnerable and near threatened they are star mark points iucn status of the red book status are very very important so do remember you may have a question kind of match the following question coming on these species also which which are which are recently identified under this herpetofauna survey but then comes the next question since for the first time india has done such kind of survey dedicated to reptiles and amphibians where they conducted it so the first herpetofaunal survey in india it was conducted in mudumalai tiger reserve who can tell me the name of a state come on this is a very simple question tell me the name of the state in the comment section below mudumalai tiger reserve is where we got such kind of interesting survey now clearly the first statement here is wrong the question says the first survey conducted in panna tiger reserve it is not sir it is not madhya pradesh it is not this we have done it in the mudu malai tiger reserve second statement is correct this survey is all about reptiles and amphibians so yeah which statement not correct the first one is not correct sir so answer is supposed to be a one only not correct this was a tough question tough because this survey is not very common not very common and it is purely and purely based on fact like 100 percent fact based questions in such cases you can skip it if you have no idea you can only take a risk if you are sure if you have if you have some gut feelings about it then only go for it otherwise tough questions are meant to be left alone going by the next question which talks about the dhordo village why dhordo village is so much in news it is true this one particular village dhordo this particular village is worldwide famous why because recently this dhordo village is recognized by un world tourism organization as being one of the best tourism villages of 2023 and that has given this particular village the so-called international fame but where which state it belongs to dhordo village is not does not does not belong to rajasthan it belongs to the state of gujarat so first statement not correct guys and why it is so important and how suddenly it has popped up in the news because the during this recent republic day parade of jan 2024 uh, uh, this year's republic day gujarat's tablus theme was this one particular village tablus all that jhaki that we that every state uh, you know uh, showcases at the at the republic day so this time gujarat's tablu theme was based on the dhordo village which is considered to be one of the best tourism villages of 2023 as per un world tourism organization i hope this point is clear so second is correct one is not correct this question again i would say this question was a medium question very fact based question but straight away question could have been attempted because this was very much in the news and that demands your attention for the preparation which statement not correct sir so one is not correct second is correct okay okay sir that brings us to the next question yeah few things i would like to uh, talk about the dhordo village i mean i have this gut feeling i don't know why but i have this gut feeling you may have the question you may have a separate mcq coming in the exam based on the village itself so yeah we have understood it is famous for tourism but what other than that few facts you need to know about dhordo this village is located in the kutch district of gujarat number one it is right at the edge of india pakistan border and this whole area of the village has lots and lots of vast salt marshes okay that is important in fact in fact this dhordo village is one of the part of the thar desert itself and here here lots of flamingos also come as a migratory birds lot of flamingos also pass by the dhordo villages so remember some of the additional fact next question is very tricky 
the question says the vault typhoon obviously upsc is not going to is not going to ask you as simple as that this question it's not like i'm i'm talking about typhoon everyone know typhoon cyclones hurricanes they are all natural disasters but obviously upsc is not going to ask you this much simple question so clearly it's too simple should be eliminated first so vault typhoon can be anything but it is clearly not natural disaster because upsc can't give you this obvious kind of question but if not a disaster what if not a cyclone what exactly this vault typhoon is it's actually a cyber threat group which is backed by china chinese government is somehow supporting this particular cyber threat group called vault typhoon okay easy question straight away question very fact based question now learn something about vault typhoon this is important guys so first thing is first this vault typhoon is nothing but a major china backed red uh, uh, hacking group china has got many such groups one another famous one is called red echo red echo is another uh, you know hacking group or cyber attack group uh, that china is supporting and now we have got another group called vault typhoon it is believed that this particular cyber attacking group or this one particular hackers group the vault typhoon is believed to pursue the development of the capabilities that could disrupt critical communication infrastructure between us and asia region during future crisis imagine guys look at the capability look at the target they really want to cut off us from asia and they really want to make sure that the critical communication infrastructure between us and asian partners should be disrupted in times of need okay so that is the kind of work that this vault typhoon is doing and when it comes to hacking and cyber attacking they are the real threats of today's warfare cyber warfare is something which we all are quite aware of right so this again is very very important next question number 72 now next question 72 talks about the ins sandhya yak or what is the sandhya yak all about and why we should be knowing about it so let's understand it very uh, in a very interesting way what we need to know about it is very important number one few things that like you can't remember every fact but few things i want you to pay attention towards the ins this is a naval ship ins is indian naval ship so this ins sandhya yak it's the first survey vessel large ship which is commissioned recently into indian army so the the theme is very clear it's a survey ship it's a survey vessel going to be used for survey purposes the word sandhya yak itself means the one who carries out a special search and that makes sense why the name is sandhya yak who has built up this ship this survey vessel ship it is one of the four ships of the so called svl survey vessel uh, uh, large ship project there is a whole project four such ships we are going to make this is first of the four and it is built it is constructed by garden reach ship builder engineers one of the largest firms when it comes to the large ship construction of the company but please remember yes it is a survey vessel ship this is the key word this is the key point that you need to remember about sandhya but it is not a nuclear propelled this sandhya yak is still a d2 it's a two diesel engine propelled uh, uh, ship it has it, it is not based on any nuclear engines it's still a diesel engine ship and uh, it can achieve a speed of 18 knots or more very very interestingly and most the special part about this ship is it has indigenous content of over 80% of its cost that makes it very very important guys now clearly if you look at the question you will see sir problem with number 2 is it nuclear powered no sir it is still a diesel powered vessel so eliminate number 2 my answer would be a only one is correct medium level question could have been attempted very straight forward no twist and turns nothing and also um apply this common sense in india i'm if if i'm talking about some survey vessel ships using nuclear power in the shipping industry is not so common it be it is still not common to have nuclear power used 
So majority of the ships are still diesel based and I can't think of having nuclear power you know getting inducted so fast. So obviously by that logic also second statement looks little wrong from that perspective. Question number 73 talks about the fungi, the yeast, it talks about mushrooms, talk about lot of other stuff. So what you need to know first, what about fungi, what about yeast, what you need to know about it very very important. As the first statement says, the fungi are eukaryotic organism. What is a eukaryotic organism guys? You must have heard in biology there are two organisms called uh, pro, uh, uh, you know, uh, one is euro, eukaryotic, another is perkaryotic. So eukaryotic are those organisms which has a proper nucleus inside a cell. They have a proper nucleus, nucleus surrounded by nuclear membrane. Such organisms are called eukaryotic organisms. And yes, it includes everything. Fungi being eukaryotic includes everything. Fungi includes mold, yeast, mushroom. They, are, they all fundamentally belong to the kingdom of fungi. Number one, first statement is correct. Second statement has a problem. It says all fungi multicellular yields simplest multicellular type. That is not the case. That is not the case at all. Why? Because both fungi and yeast, both can be unicellular, both can be multicellular. So there is absolutely okay with fungi and yeast being multi or unicellular. Please remember one more thing. As you can see in statement number 3, I am continuously trying to make you understand how to solve this question. Very strong, very very important, the third statement is a make or break point. Why? If you look at the statement number 3, it says some mushrooms are autotrophs. They can make their own food and some rely on other food sources. Do you think that happens? Autotropism is only, only relates to the plants. Is mushroom a plant? No sir. Mushroom is a fungi, it's not a plant. So clearly, mushrooms can't make their own food. Mushrooms cannot be autotroph. Mushrooms, very logically, they are not autotroph, they are heterotroph. They depend on other food sources, for sure. Now, if you understand this statement 3 and carefully eliminate option number 3 and try to eliminate things from here, uh, at least your option number D is going to get eliminated. If you eliminate option number 2, so clearly sir, I am going to get my answer and my answer would be B, 1, 4 and 5. Without even reading 3 and 4 and 5, you still have got your answer. So here very smartly with logic you can eliminate few of the options. Yes, I know that mushrooms have medicinal properties and many of the mushrooms are used for traditional medicines as well, yes sir. Even mushrooms are used for biotechnology also, that is fine. So fourth, fifth, first are correct, right answer needs to be B. Medium level question I would say, something you could have attempted easily because these two statements look quite obviously wrong and where they are, used, they are obviously wrong plus you have this so called elimination technique, at least you can take a risk. If not 100% sure, at least you can be 70-80% sure and still can attempt this question. It's a very very important question and do read more about mushrooms because you expect lot of questions coming on mushroom these years. Mushroom itself is a very important topic that you need to prepare. Question number 74 talks about the data exclusivity. What I need to talk, what I need to learn about the data exclusivity. So one thing I can understand, yes it has something to do with intellectual property. I am talking about data, data protection, data exclusivity means it has something to do with intellectual property that I can analyze. Now please remember when I talk about data analytics or I talk about data exclusivity, what, what I need to remember when I talk data exclusivity, please remember data exclusivity is nothing but a type of intellectual property protection. Yeah, data exclusivity is all about intellectual property protection that applies very specifically to data, especially from the pharmaceutical clinical trials. Data exclusivity has a direct connection. It is the pharmaceutical clinical trials data which is very confidential and that's why the data is classified as data exclusivity. Understood? 
where all the innovator firms they are running their own clinical trials to gain the market approval generic manufacturers rely on innovators clinical trial for some of the approvals and for that matter for that purpose these data exclusivity matters a lot while granting any vaccine or any new uh, 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 you know medicine giving a approval for that purpose this is important number 2 when you talk about data exclusivity it these rules they keep the generic firms from relying on the data of 5 to 12 years depending on specific law that is also true also remember one thing that while the wto the world trade organization trips agreement which which actually protect the ipr intellectual property rights even the world's wto's trip agreement protect the data from the unfair commercial use but it does not mandate the rules blocking generic product registration so from every perspective you can see the three statements are absolutely correct so here my answer would be 1 2 and 3 please remember you talk about pharmaceutical here is your intellectual property right called data exclusivity so this is absolutely important so yeah here what to do this was a tough question now what to do if you are not sure about this i recommend you guys to skip it because because you see like some yeah sometimes you can take a risk why because some options are quite obvious but you know facts very deep facts hard facts like that always going to confuse you and you don't have the elimination option as well so be very very careful very very careful while attempting this particular kind of question mm -hmm. so you can skip if you want because questions are being tough here and very less scope of elimination question 75 talks about the black holes so what i and please care be careful the question has exclusively mentioned the two types of the black holes it talks about one super massive black holes number two it talks about the stellar black holes what exactly is it is and what is the difference between the two that we need to understand so first understand the little basics of a black hole what is a black hole we know it from ages we we are talking about it for so long time black holes are nothing but extremely dense stars with a very very strong gravitational attraction e that much strong not even light can escape and that's why black holes means complete dark it doesn't even let the light escape from it that is the power of a black hole Albert Einstein way back in 1916 predicted the existence of the black holes and look he predicted in 1916 in his theory of relative uh, theory of relativity and after almost 103 years later after that prediction in 2019 only the event horizon ho event horizon telescope got the first image ever of black hole it took us more than 100 years to actually get one photograph of the black hole and there are many things many crazy theories about black holes like one of the facts says black holes they do not die rather theoretically they evaporate over a long period of time and based on different different characteristics and the behaviors of the black holes now astronomers have identified there are three types of the black holes out of the three we are focusing on stellar and supermassive the third type of black hole is intermediate types but our focus is stellar and supermassive what is a stellar what is a stellar black hole well the the stellar black hole means where a star used up all its fuel because you know what happens when, what happens in a star star is all about the hydrogen getting converted into helium and this whole nuclear fusion reaction is the one that is actually burning the fuel so the presence of hydrogen is to converting it to the helium that is the fuel we are talking about so there comes a stage in the life of a black hole where uh, where the star ends up and used all its fuel it is now it has nothing to do nothing in the name of fuel after completely using its fuel the star may collapse now the smaller stars smaller like three times smaller than normal sun's mass that time when this collapse happen the smaller stars turn into neutron stars or the white dwarf depends 
if uh, if you have got simple uh, nova explosion you are going to get white dwarf as a recoil neutron stars in the case of supernova in that case i am going to get a neutron star as a recoil star that that happens in small stars but for the larger stars when they collapse they keep compressing 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 connected as white dwarf or neutron star stars because there is a very famous line you need to remember black holes are the results of supernova explosion of supermassive stars so for all the supermassive large stars when they keep collapsing keep comprom compromising they form the stellar from supermassive black supermassive black holes are the results of hundreds and thousands of the tiny black holes merging together and when that happens when when these thousands of tiny black holes merge we always going to find a large gas cloud and that large gas cloud is responsible for collapsing together and then rapidly accelerating the mass and such large cluster of the dark matter that comes out from this whole collision we have the supermassive black holes if this was this is clear to you and if you look at the statement the only problem is the question has inter exchanged the two terms the first statement is not about supermassive star it is about the stellar black hole similarly the number 2 is not about the stellar black hole it, it is about the supermassive black holes question level was tough it is obviously tough. tough question i would not recommend to take you on this risk you should skip because this is a tough question and it is meant to confuse you a lot so here both statements not correct because they are being inter exchange right answer is supposed to be d but now from this point onwards please remember the stellar and the supermassive black holes both topics are very important that brings us to the question number 76 Question seventy six talks about very common topic, and every two months the Reserve Bank of India they uh, issues their monetary policy, and with every monetary policy we hear, hear these kind of terms: a commodative stance of the RBI, hawkish stance of the RBI, and we talk about the uh, neutral stance of the RBI. It's a very common, very common topics. Now the question is about the hawkish stance of a central bank. What exactly? in monetary policy what is the hawkish stance let me tell let me give you one very basic thing very basic example any central bank any central bank across the world has two major objectives number one there are two things that they have to focus upon one is growth growth development that is their first priority and second priority is inflation every time every monetary policy which is made by central bank ensures that and it it has to be clear i am focusing on what if a central bank has a neutral approach and wants to balance that you know inflation and growth has to go hand in hand it's a neutral stance when the rbi decides growth is my objective and growth development is more prior than the inflation that is called the accommodative stance in accommodative stance reserve bank of india main goal is growth rates for that purpose they want to increase the money supply they are going to reduce the interest rates that's what they do but if in case the central bank decides controlling inflation is my target now that is what you call the hawkish stance where my first priority is to control inflation if even if it hampers growth for a short term that is still okay and how i can do that how i i can control inflation when i increase the interest rates if i increase the interest rates i am automatically going to reduce my money supply and it is very important to reduce the money supply if you want to control the inflation to reduce the demand clear so right answer is supposed to be b hawkish stance means central bank's top priority is to keep inflation low during such a phase are uh, any central bank willing to hike the interest rates to reduce the money supply and reduce the demand so yes if you are at a hawkish stance it means you are following tight monetary policy 
tight monetary policy is the right word. So here very easy question, very straight away question and it is something that comes in newspaper every two months. So you can't give the excuse that we are not prepared or we do not know about it. Because every, for, for because you know uh, like in the whole year RBI in India issues a bi-monthly monetary policy. So every year there are six monetary policy that comes from the central bank and you should be prepared of all these kind of stances that they take. Question 77 is all about the zero coupon, zero principal instrument. What is zero coupon, zero principal instrument and why they are in, you, they are in news and what I should know about them. A few things I am going to discuss about. What is this so called zero coupon, zero principal instrument and why the name is so? First thing is first, all these zero coupon, zero uh, uh, zero principal instrument like right? so all this Z uh, C Z P I this particular kind of instruments they are issued by a not for profit organization this is first thing but what exactly they are what are what exactly they are these principal instruments unlike the traditional bonds equities the zero coupon zero principal instruments they do not yield interest do not they do not give you return they are not going to return the principal amount upon maturity but what happens normally normally when you purchase any bond if you are going to purchase any bond of course that bond has a face value has a discount value you purchase a discounted value and you get the face value when the bond matures and you being a investor you make some money because you have given the government money uh, in the name of bond and when that matures you are going to get back your original principal and the interest or the or some extra profit that you have made. But the name zero coupon zero principal instrument itself says that these are the bonds but they are not going to give you any interest not going to give you even you are not going to get the principal back means what so they are pure donations. If you want to donate some money to something, so you are going to go for zero coupon, zero principal instruments and that is why they are issued by not for profit organizations. Number two, they are considered as securities under the security contracts. They are still considered securities and since they are considered securities, so they are, they are going to be governed by the Security and Exchange Board of India, SEBI. And another very famous example of, uh, of uh, let me give you an example of the zero coupon, zero principal instrument that name is Unnati. Unnati is an example of this kind of zero coupon bond. It's a non, not for profit organization. Unnati is a not for profit organization issuing India's first zero coupon, zero principal instrument on the social stock exchange. All the funds raised by this not for profit organization Unnati, why and now you can un understand why why it has uh, listed this, uh, this uh, instrument on social stock exchange because their objective is simple. They want, they want donations and why they want donations? All the money that is going to be raised by Unnati not for profit organization, they are going to use it to train and place the underprivileged youth and that is why these things are important. So please remember if you look at the question. The first statement is correct, third is correct, only problem is third, second, second statement because it says they are not considered as securities, they are, they are securities and that's, that's why they always come under the SEBI's banner. So two statements are correct, the first and the third one, second not correct, okay. The name itself says a lot, zero coupon, zero principal, so it itself, here zero coupon means zero interest you can think of. If you remember zero interest, zero principal, that makes you understand why statement number one is correct. So here coupon means interest. You are not going to get any money uh, in one way or the other. Okay, so right. Uh, so this level of the question, I would say it was a medium level question, but you guys can still attempt it, or at least take a risk because second statement is little confusing to decode. But I think first and third are very obvious, right? And you may have a question, separate question, more questions coming on that. So be prepared. The next question is very uh, 
obvious very famous question of the UPSC pattern you have got some reports and you have got the organizations publishing them so of course no logic is going to serve you it's purely fact based question logistic performance index not by UNDP but this is an index prepared by World Bank world economic outlook it is all the work of IMF so clearly number one number two are wrong third is correct when we have this finance of the Panchayati Raj institutions yes you can expect such report from the Reserve Bank of India obviously how many options correctly match only one was it tough I would say it was an easy one straightforward question and I told you many times do prepare the list of the names of all important reports published by World Bank published by IMF published by uh, UNDP UNEP all important uh, international bodies so do prepare a list before you go to the question uh, to the exam right they're important things guys <clears throat> so talking about logistic performance index the LPI this is a, actually an interactive benching tool which is developed by World Bank why why world bank has got this logistic performance index the purpose is to help countries identify the trade logistic challenges and world bank want to support the countries by improving the opportunities improving the performance of a country in terms of logistic performance when it comes to india india has a very good rank in this logistic performance index india's rank is 38 out of 139 countries in fact india has improved its rank by six places India used to be 44 at one point of time now we are 38 but how do you evaluate the performance of a country logistic performance how do you evaluate how what what are the met methods or parameter there are six parameters which are used by World Bank to evaluate the logistic performance of a country how good you are doing in terms of custom performance infrastructure quality ease of arranging shipments logistic service qualities consignment tracking tracing timeline timelines of shipments so these six parameters are used now talking about another one which we talked about the world economic outlook yes world economic outlook belongs to IMF it is world economic outlook published by IMF and they publish it twice a year so every six month every six month you are going to get the world economic outlook and it talks about the overall growth trade that that is there at global economy so that you need to remember brings us to the question number 79 the question 79 is a tough question very tough why it talks about something called as obelisk it talks about why vi viroids talks about the viruses now, these three terms are <laughs> very challenging so first let me let me explain it to you guys then I'll come back to the question so what is the obelisk and why we should be talking about it obelisk are basically circular bits of genetic material that contain one or two genes and they shape themselves they are road like shape kind of thing that that they mold themselves into what is an obelisk they are not purely virus so see this this type of genetic material or self organizing uh, kind of uh, material they are not exactly virus so they lie somewhere between the virus and the viroids they are not exactly virus not exactly viroid they are somewhere in between and they have this genetic material with them in fact the obelix are made up of RNA and they have some proteins also and that's why they can facilitate self replication within the bacterial cells the, obli uh, the obelisk have this tendency they can self replicate them within any bacterial cells in fact these obelisks rely on microbial host cells in fact they perform identical functions across all diverse bacterial st uh, strains but what is the difference between the virus and viroid that makes the question really tough and this is one particular topic that is actually you you must learn from this one particular slide what is a virus and what is a viroid what is the difference between the two so you you talk about virus virus is one such nucleic uh, is one such uh, you know organism which is have which can be made up of a dna or rna 
a virus can be made up of both can have both type of genetic material but viroid strictly depends on rna only there is no space for dna here so first basic difference virus can be dna based rna based but viroid are always rna based a virus is a non living they lack cellular structures independent metabolic processes whereas viroids are also non living but they lack protein codes they don't have protein encoding capability which is there in case of viruses so viruses they have this protein coating that is not the case with viroids it says no the viruses are surrounded by protein coat but that is not the case with viroids okay that is important you have some examples also virus common examples influenza virus hiv sars cov 2 that we have seen viroid potato swindle tuber viroid coconut you know kadang viroid so these are the types of viroid examples if you look at the question everything is fine everything is perfect but there is problem with the statement number 2 and statement number 3 basically they are interchanged viroids are short circular rna molecules not the viruses and viruses are made up of both dna rna so we have just interchanged option number 2 and 3 so remember you may have a question about the obelisk and you have this difference in your mind of virus and viroids so second third are incorrect okay so how many statements are correct ji only one statement is correct with respect to the obelisk that is important level of the question very tough literally very tough do you what do you think you should attempt this kind of question or take a blind risk please don't take a blind risk don't risk it if you can't attempt these kind of questions there is absolutely no way no chance of doing any guesswork no guesswork is going to help you in this better to skip this question rather getting into the guesswork and getting into negative marking for no reason last question question number 80 talks about the gray warfare this is a very interesting uh, you know terminology which is now in the news so generally between the two countries you have either peace or you have a full fledged war okay that is there are two situations either i am in peace with you or i am at war with you but now there is a new space called the gray space the gray the gray warfare is between these two areas we are at peace we are not at war but of course this particular gray warfare represent all the activities between peace and war including some illegal economic activities maybe doing something cyber attack may be trying to destabilize the other country and this is a pure classic example between india and china india china they are in a, not in a state of peace not in a state of war so we are in a kind of gray warfare with china and in gray warfare certain things are specially taken care please you need to learn this is a very important term and very much in news these days so the term gray zone gained prominence by the way the china's activities are going on in south china sea the dispute between the six countries over the exclusive economic zone of south china sea where where china wants to dominate the the game and india's china's issue that that we are having so gray zone basically has everything it involves military we have seen the way galwan issue happened no military actions are there but of course we are not going to accelerate the military actions very controlled military actions are there even in the gray zone countries can involve state or non state actors non military tools and you we have we have just learned the cyber warfare is one such thing which china is doing with india we have uh, and we have we have seen uh, the groups like the red echo group the world typhoon groups these are some of the groups which are used by china to do cyber attacks on india so you understand so this this is all what china is doing with india that is a part of gray zone or gray warfare you see this is how you can uh, you can portray it on the venn diagram so this gray warfare is best represented by the term a that has to be a right answer so it's not a, not any asymmetric warfare it's not about doing anything else but yeah it is it is pure activities between the p 
peace and the war so yeah medium level question but uh, i think you can you can still risk the question because you can you you can uh, eliminate other options of course gray warfare cannot be any asymmetric warfare gray warfare it is not about using small attacking mobile force comparatively weaker countries against that can't be the right word because generally we use the word gray between white and black something which is white white is peace and black is war so something which is between white and black that's that we term as gray isn't it so right answer in this case supposed to be a medium level you can still take a risk and give the right answer okay so these were the questions that we have discussed in this particular video i really hope that you have enjoyed our video guys so see you guys very very soon with the part number 5 the last part that is going to get uh, that there also we will be talking about the next 20 questions how was your experience of this video i hope you have enjoyed you have learned a lot from this video discussion if you did then do not forget to give your feedback in the comment section box see you guys very very soon in the next video till then all the best wishes jai hind jai bharat